Speak up, baby gods. I know it's been a minute, but your boy is back. Before doing anything, please like, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. So with the upcoming raid of Area 51 on September 20th, I thought a good topic for today's video would be Top 5 UFOs in Biblical Paintings. I know this sounds rather controversial and the first time we're diving into religious territory in this channel, but I think there's some very thought-provoking content here. I know there's both believers and skeptics of both religion and UFOs respectively, so please watch until the end of the video because I would love to know your thoughts in the comments below, especially regarding some of the quotes near the end of the video. Heads up, I'm about to butcher some of these artists' names, but let's begin. Number 1. The Baptism of Christ Created by the Dutch painter Art de Gelder in 1710, which is currently held at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is the Art and Antiquities Museum of the University of Cambridge and England. So right off the bat, we can see this disc-shaped glowing UFO with four beams of light. This disc-shaped object looks oddly familiar to the disc-shaped objects in the several pieces of UFO footage officially released by the US government in late 2017 and early 2018. I have a whole analysis video on this footage, so please check that out. Link is in the video description below. So why would a UFO be disc-shaped? Without even getting scientific, a disc intuitively looks extremely aerodynamic and one would assume it could move in all directions instead of one like our conventional airplanes. But let's not get ahead of ourselves before labeling this object as a UFO without some further analysis. The scene depicts St. John the Baptist, surrounded by a crowd of individuals observing the baptism of Lord Jesus Christ. Upon closer inspection of the disc-shaped light in the clouds, we can actually see a white dove positioned at its center. The dove in the Bible is symbolic of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, which in addition to the Father and Son, make up the Holy Trinity. Okay, perfect. So this isn't a UFO, it's just a religious depiction of the Holy Spirit during the baptism of Christ. Honestly, that's a completely valid reason, but I'm just not satisfied, so let's dive a little deeper. What is the Holy Ghost and why is it depicted with a flying dove? Upon some serious investigation, the Holy Spirit is the least understood of the Holy Trinity, and upon reading the context in which it is invoked in the following texts, the most I can conclude is that it is some ambiguous supernatural force. Here are the passages from all four Gospels regarding the baptism of Christ. Luke 3, 21-22 now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Matthew 3.16 And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Mark 1.10 just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. John 1.32 And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. In all four Gospels, and in whatever version of the Bible you read, whether it be the King James, English Standard Edition, New International Version, they all mention that the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, not that it is a dove. The exact terminology used, descending like a dove, seems like the way we would describe an aerial maneuver performed by a plane or aircraft. A dove is a bird, birds represent flight, so is it possible that this is a metaphor to describe an object that they simply did not have a word for that is capable of flight? Furthermore, I want to analyze the four rays emitted from this object in the photo. You would expect these rays to be a sun ray from some opening in the cloud layer, but the painting does not depict the clouds parted in such a way. Rather, it depicts the four arguably artificial looking rays coming directly from the Holy Spirit, whatever that may be in this specific context, shining on Jesus. It does not look that organic, and one would normally expect a single large sun ray from a cloud opening shining on Jesus, rather than four thin beam-like rays emitting from the shining aerial phenomenon. It's possible it was done for stylistic reasons, maybe to represent the four cardinal points, maybe the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four gospels, or the most intriguing, the four beings seen in a burning cloud by Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1, 4-5 I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by a brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like a glowing metal. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form is human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. More on this burning cloud metal thing later in the video, but is it possible that these lights are from an aerial craft? Their interpretation is yours at the end of the day. 
So to avoid bias, let's look at how other artists depicted the baptism of Christ. All of this imagery definitely incorporates a dove, which is not a surprise since the word dove is name dropped directly in the scene described in all four gospels. Another piece of symbolism I would like to highlight is that the Holy Spirit also seems to be connected with the clouds and circles of light representing divinity. So looking at these paintings, one could conclude that the circles of light in the interpretation by Arndt Gelder is simply a representation of divinity. But I would like to mention one point. Though the circles of light in the other depictions do not directly look like flying crafts, it is possible Arndt Gelder had access to information that was not available to all. In the book Modern Technology and Sciences in the Bible, the authors Alla Peace and John Anderson state the following. Curiously, where did the theme of the UFO presence during Jesus' baptism come from? How did the painting end in the bishop's office? Why was the artist not afraid of an inquisition accusation? How was the idea accepted in the beginning of the 18th century? De Gelder had access to the Vatican's paintings and literature on Jesus Christ. He had surely seen other paintings with UFOs and decided to do the same. Everyone knows that the Vatican owns secret paintings and literature. All works that put the religion in dander were censored. I could not find any additional citation or verification of whether Art de Gelter had access to Vatican documentation, so take this with a grain of salt. But I do agree that different artists could have much different source materials which would result in different renditions of this scene. For example, scientists with better data are more likely to develop a more accurate theory of reality. At the same time, scientists with the exact same data could develop vastly different theories based on their interpretation. Therefore, good data in combination with a good interpretation will result in the best theory. This is nothing new as most ancient maps, paintings, and literature are unoriginal and are based on older works. With the amount of books, scrolls, and libraries that have been burnt throughout history, I wouldn't be surprised if we ever uncover these lost gems. The suppression of knowledge has and still is a phenomenon. So the ancient alien theorists will tell you that the disk of light is definitive proof of UFOs without mentioning the dove at its center. The skeptics and debunkers will tell you to look at other depictions of this scene and that this painting is simply an artistic representation of divinity and that the dove represents the Holy Spirit, leaving it at just that. In conclusion, this disc-shaped light could very well be a representation of divinity, but at the same time, I would like you to ponder what that actually means. Why do all four Gospels clearly describe the Holy Ghost completing some sort of bird-like descending maneuver? Does the dove represent flight? Moving on to the next painting, number 2, The Miracle of the Snow, by Mussolino da Panicale, created between 1428 to 1432, held at the Museo di Capimonte in Naples. I was reluctant from including this photo as it is not an actual scene in the Bible but is based on an ancient tradition which states that on the summer night between the 4th and 5th of August in 352 AD, a Roman nobleman and Pope Liberius both dreamt that Mary wanted a church built on the Esquiline Hill. On August 5th, snow fell in a mysterious rectangular formation on Esquiline Hill and a basilica was erected, the Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore, found in modern day Rome. In winter months, it does indeed snow in Rome on very, very rare occasions, but I'd say it would be impossible for it to snow during August. Regardless, this mysterious event is still celebrated annually in modern day on August 5th. What I really want to focus on here is the association between Jesus, Mary, and the clouds, especially after Ezekiel's description of the glowing metal cloud. These clouds look awfully disc-shaped. They could be lenticular clouds, even though I have not found images of lenticular clouds in such an armada. But the only takeaway I want to associate with this painting is the association between divinity and the clouds. Next, let's move on to painting number 3, The Annunciation with Saint Emidius by Carlo Crivelli, painted in 1486, held at the National Gallery in London, England. The scene is of the Annunciation, which is the announcement by the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary that she would conceive a son by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the son was to be called Jesus. As usual, the Holy Spirit is depicted with the dove. But I would like you to take attention to the disc-shaped cloud formation in the sky. Upon zooming in, we can see that this is most likely not an aircraft as there are two rings of angels, which is a common representation of divinity. But what does this mean? What is this association between divinity and the clouds? Gabriel says to Mary in Luke 1.35, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It states that the Holy Ghost will overshadow Mary, if taken literally, meaning will tower above or cast a shadow over Mary. How is the Holy Ghost 
able to overshadow Mary. Is the Holy Ghost a physical entity? Could it be that the Holy Ghost is actually this disc-shaped cloud or object that is depicted in these various artworks? And the dove symbolizes this object's ability to fly and maneuver through the air like a bird. How else would it be able to overshadow her? It's completely possible I am taking this line way too literally. So I researched a bunch of examples between the connection between God and the clouds throughout the Bible and here's what I found. Exodus 16.10 And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Exodus 19.9 The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, Isaiah 68 Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Revelation 1 7 Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. So it seems people can see this divine cloud. It is not metaphysical in these descriptions. It definitely seems physical. Isaiah 19 1 An oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. The heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Exodus 24, 15 to 18. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Matthew 17.5 While he was speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Mark 9.7 And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So the ESV version states that the talking cloud overshadowed them. Maybe that is what is meant during the passage regarding the Annunciation where the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. Let's continue. Ezekiel 1.4 As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, a gleaming metal. 1 Kings 8, 10 to 11 When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled this temple. Revelation 11:12. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. Numbers 9, 15 to 23. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law, was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning. When it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. At the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with its command through Moses. If you didn't follow along, Moses and his crew are literally following this burning cloud as it repetitively stops and moves for literally over a year or a year. The cloud without a doubt represents the Lord in all of these examples, but I would argue to say it is not metaphysical or metaphorical as many individuals can actually witness it. Why is the Lord represented as a burning cloud? Is it a coincidence that these divine clouds are depicted as mysterious disc-shaped objects in these paintings? All these passages and the whole cryptic cloud symbolism deserves its own video, and I'm reluctant from calling it a cloud anymore. Moving forward, how is the Lord able to communicate with people? Let's focus on this beam of light from the burning cloud to Mary's head. Is this some sort of wireless communication to the brain? All modern forms of wireless technology use light, specifically radio waves, to communicate, but we'll more on this in the next video, as I'm going to cut it off here. To avoid bias, let's look at some other renditions of the Annunciation. The combination of both the cloud and dove symbolism is found in many but not all representations of the Annunciation. Like before, this symbolism could simply be a representation of divinity, whatever that may mean to you, but as previously mentioned, different artists have different interpretations and different source materials. I did say top 5, so here are the last two photos, which I'll analyze in the upcoming part 2 to this video.
If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching and I would love to know your thoughts in the comments below and let me know if any of my trains of thought were wildly off and why. Specifically, I would love to know your interpretation of all of those cloud quotes. Please like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. New video coming next Sunday, but till then, stay woke, baby gods.